Hi, welcome to another episode of African Biographics. In this video, we go back in history to do a brief explanation of the Angolan Civil War. The war started in 1975 when fighting broke out between the Popular Movement for the Liberation of Angola, the MPLA, and the National Union for the Total Independence of Angola, UNITA, led by Jonas Sabimbi, as well as the FNLA. The war quickly degenerated into a proxy war for the Cold War, with the Soviet Union and Cuba supporting the MPLA, while the FNLA and UNITA were supported by South Africa, Zaire, China and the United States. Up to 1.5 million lives may have been lost and 4 million people displaced during the more than a quarter century of fighting. In this video, we look at the background of this war, the different phases during the war and what led to eventual peace in Angola. If you are new here, don't be shy to subscribe and to click the notifications bell so that you don't miss out on any new content. After 15 years of liberation struggle, Angola attained independence from Portugal in 1975. Almost immediately, the country descended into a civil war as a power struggle ensued between the three former liberation movements, namely the Popular Movement for the Liberation of Angola MPLA, the National Union for Total Independence of Angola UNITA, and the National Front for the Liberation of Angola, the FNLA. This was after a power sharing agreement amongst the parties had failed. It is said that this power sharing agreement failed as a result of the reluctance of the dominant liberation movements to share power within the multi-ethnic society of Angola. So let me give you a quick background of the different Angolan groups who were involved in this war. The People's Movement for the Liberation of Angola, who are later referred to as the MPLA, were formed in December of 1956 as an offshoot of the Angolan Communist Party and had its support based amongst the Ambundu people and was largely supported by other African countries, Cuba and the Soviet Union. The National Liberation Front of Angola, which are referred to as the FNLA, were founded in 1962 and was rooted among the Bakongo people and strongly supported the restoration and defense of the Congo Empire, eventually developing a nationalist movement supported by the government of Zaire and initially the People's Republic of China. The Ovimbundu people formed the base for the National Union for the Total Independence of Angola, UNITA, which was established in 1966 and founded by a prominent former leader of the FNLA, Jonas Savimbi. As you can see from this brief background, the war was not purely a war between the Angolans. Behind the three opposing groups stood an array of international backers as the Angolan civil war would degenerate into a proxy war for the Cold War. These backers were striving to give their chosen movements the impetus to win the war on the ground. As previously mentioned, the Soviet Union and Cuba were the main support for the MPLA. According to them, the principal reason for their intervention in the conflict was the fact that the military forces of South Africa had stormed Angola in order to deny the MPLA its legitimate right to govern. For Cuba, the dramatic airlift of troops into Angola was an expression of solidarity with the MPLA, which according to them was a target of a coalition of imperialistic and racist forces. On the other side, the FNLA and UNITA were supported by South Africa, Zaire, China and the United States. The United States took a different perspective of the prevailing situation from that of the MPLA supporters. The United States would see the Soviet and Cuban involvement in Angola as an attempt by Moscow to gain a foothold in Southern Africa and significantly extend the Soviet Union's global reach. Now, with the assistance of Cuban troops and Soviet support, the MPLA managed to win the initial phase of fighting between 1975 to 1976 and managed to oust the FNLA from Luanda and become the de facto Angolan government. They also managed to win the recognition of many other African countries. Following this, the FNLA would disintegrate, but the United States and South African-backed UNITA continued its guerrilla warfare against the MPLA government from its base in the east and south of the country. With the assistance of the apartheid South African government, UNITA reorganized itself as an effective guerrilla force. South African aid to UNITA and military intervention in Angola were partly motivated by the MPLA's support for the Southwestern Africa People's Organization, SWAPO, which was fighting for the independence of Namibia. The Americans would send military aid to UNITA via Zaire. The whole country was engulfed in warfare. But in 1988, South African troops were defeated in southern Angola. They were confronted with the numerically superior Cuban and Angolan troops and backed down rather than risking the loss of a large number of troops. 
Heavy fighting would continue until 1991, when a temporary agreement known as the Baisisi Accord was reached. It called for an immediate ceasefire and the removal of both Cuban and South African troops, and the agreement mandated a new national government and army, along with Angola's first multi-party elections. Following the defeat and the subsequent accord, South Africa promised to grant independence to Namibia and to stop supporting UNITA, while the Cubans agreed to withdraw their troops. A year later, the MPLA candidate Jose Eduardo dos Santos won 49% of the popular vote in the election compared to 40% for the UNITA candidate, Jonas Savimpi. When Savimpi disputed the outcome, UNITA resumed guerrilla war against the MPLA. By 1993, the administration of Bill Clinton had recognized the Angolan government of the MPLA. That same year, the United Nations Security Council would impose an arms and fuel embargo on UNITA. Just like what we saw in the Second Congo War, like the DRC, Angola also suffered from the resource case and this was the major driving point in the war. Angola is notably rich in mineral reserves including oil, iron, copper, bauxite, diamonds and uranium. So Angola's resource world became a means of funding the ongoing war between the MPLA and UNITA, with both parties extensively exploiting the country's oil and diamond reserves. During the years of the Civil War, UNITA was able to capture several major diamond mines, which served as a primary resource for financing arms and fuel, and funding the liberation movement's guerrilla campaigns against the MPLA. It is said that this civil war was being funded by sales of diamonds and oil to the United States of America, the United Kingdom, France, Russia and Cuba in exchange for weapons and military personnel. September 1993 would see the United States issue an executive order which declared a national emergency in Angola and invoking the International Emergency Economic Powers Act and the United Nations Participating Act prohibiting any form of United States aid to Angola except through the designated entry points and also forbidding supply to UNITA. 1994 would see the MPLA government and UNITA sign the Lusaka Protocol Peace Accord in Zambia. The parties would agree to establish a joint transitional government. In practice, however, the struggle for power would continue. Although minor fighting between the two groups continued, Jose dos Santos and Zavimbi met several times over the next three years to resolve issues relating to the final form of the combined government. United Nations peacekeepers would arrive in Angola in 1995 to ensure a peaceful transitional government. In August of 1996, Savimbi finally agreed to accept the title of the leader of the opposition, but he declined to attend a ceremony in April of 1997 at which UNITA delegates formally joined the government. Despite all of this, relations between the two groups were further complicated that year by the civil war in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. UNITA supported the crumbling Zaire regime of Mobutu Sese Seko because the group had been able to transport its diamonds through the country, while the Angolan government supported the victorious rebels led by Laurent Kabila. By the way, you can check out my video that I did on the Second Congo War for more detail. By the beginning of the 21st century, hostilities between the government and UNITA had resumed and the UNITA delegates had been expelled from the government. However, with the killing of Jonas Savimbi, who was shot dead in an ambush by the government forces in February of 2002, talks would resume between the UNITA leadership and the government, finally culminating in a peace agreement in April of 2002. Although the country breathed a collective sigh of relief with the end of the 27 years of the civil war, the Angolan government was faced with the daunting challenge of rebuilding the country's physical and social welfare infrastructure, much of which was completely destroyed. It is estimated that the civil war had displaced more than 4 million people and some say that about 1.5 million people may have died. The country of Angola is still reeling from the effects of the war and is still on a building process. Let me know in the comment section below if you think Angola will be able to put the effects of the war behind and start the building process and become a major power in Africa. This has been today's episode of African Biographics. Thank you all for tuning in. Remember to like and share the video if you enjoyed it. My name is Tatenda. Until next time, cheers. Have a good one.